We're going to look today in Isaiah 9. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 will be our text. And let's read together the word of the living and the true God. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There's a saying that is a part of our common parlance that I'm sure most of you are familiar with. It's the phrase, there's nothing new under the sun. Anybody ever heard that phrase before? It comes from a passage of scripture in Ecclesiastes 1, 9, and 10, which says this. That which has been is that which will be, and that which has been done is that which will be done. So there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one might say, see this, is it new? Already it has existed for ages which are before us. You've heard that phrase before. We use it when we encounter something strange or rare in life, and we're tempted to think that we might be the first person to have experienced it. The wisdom of God cries, there's nothing new under the sun. So it is for the human desire, hunger, and endless search for peace. The longing for peace is one of the deepest desires of the human heart, and it has been since the fall in the garden. Ever since the first man, Adam, sinned against God, our human experience has been marked by a pursuit of the elusive quarry of peace. It was no different in Isaiah's day. Isaiah is a book that is filled with war and the threats of war. All through the book, you find discourses about God's judgment against nations like Babylon, Egypt, Tarshish, and yes, even the northern kingdom of Israel. During this time, Judah, the southern kingdom, faced continual threats from her neighbors. They had to endure an awful assault from the Assyrians under Sennacherib. Some scholars believe it may have been more than one. This was a dark time in the history of the people of God. Peace was a dream, a fantasy that surely could not be realized. And there's nothing new under the sun. It was no different in Jesus' day. The nation of Israel was then under the thumb of the Roman Empire. The people were being exploited by the religious elite of their day. And in Luke chapter 19, we find Jesus approaching Jerusalem and weeping over the city, saying in verse 42, if you had known in this day even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. They were truly a people walking in darkness. Peace had hidden itself from them, and there is nothing new under the sun. We also are a people desperately searching for peace. All you have to do to see it is just look around you. Just turn on the news. Does anybody watch the news anymore? No, I don't either. (laughs) Turn on Facebook or Instagram. Terrible ideas, don't. (laughs) Turn on TikTok, really terrible idea. (laughs) Or Twitter, whatever your favorite social media platform is. All around us, we see the effects of the failed pursuit of peace. Hopelessness is on the rise. A lack of purpose is infecting our culture, especially our young people. Society is as fractured as ever and is becoming more so by the day. We thought in our infinite wisdom that the virtual connectivity afforded us by things like YouTube and social media would bring people together. And while in a sense they have... They have also ushered in the unintended consequence of despair because of the cancer of comparison. Young people desperate for validation in the form of likes, clicks, and streams are trying to find their purpose and value in comparing themselves to influencers. They're looking to people they deem successful 
and seeing the ways in which they themselves fall short of that standard of wealth, money, power, popularity, and affluence. Then they realize that they cannot meet that standard that their idol has set for them, so they begin to see themselves as worthless, not good enough, not pretty enough. Suicidal ideation is climbing at alarming rates. Debilitating anxiety is increasing at all age levels. Listen to this statistic I read. It, this will blow your mind. Rates of major depression in teenagers increased 52% in the 2010s from the previous decade and 63% among young adults. I want to read that again. Rates of major depression in teenagers increased 52% in the 2010s from the previous decade and 63% among young adults. We are a people in a desperate search for peace. And there's nothing new under the sun. Peace has been the main pursuit of man throughout his dark and confused history, church. We look for peace in all the wrong places. There's nothing new under the sun. Did you know the nation of Judah did the same thing? In 2 Kings 16, which happened during the time of Isaiah that we read here, the kings of Aram and Israel besieged Jerusalem, and although they did not take the city, Ahaz, the king of Judah, sent a message to the king of Assyria asking him to help against his enemies. So Judah allied itself with Assyria against Aram and Israel, and it wasn't long after that that Assyria destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel. Well, who do you think Assyria turned on next? You guessed it. It was Judah. Ahaz was so desperate for peace that he allied himself with a nation that would later attack his own kingdom. Just like the people in Isaiah's day, we long for, we ache for, we grope for, and we reach for peace. And we find it just as elusive. Thankfully, that's not the end of the story. You'll be glad to hear that, I'm sure. Because here's something we also need to remember about this time in the life of God's people. This dark, uncertain, perilous time is also the time when God showed up with a word for his people. And it wasn't just a word, it was a promise. Can I just stop here a moment and tell you when things look the darkest, that's the time when God likes to show up and give you a word of promise. When it looks like the storm is going to capsize your boat, that's when he stands up and says, peace, be still. Just when you think you can't make it one more step, that's when God shows up. So maybe it's time to get your eyes off your problems and start anticipating the arrival of the Prince of Peace in your life. After all, that's what this Advent season is all about. Like a small candle being lit in a perpetually dark room, this promise shone forth in the darkness of the people of Judah, and it shines forth to you who are in desperate need of peace today. And that promise is this, a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. And I love the fact that when God sent forth this promise of peace, that it didn't take the form of a military victory. His promise of peace didn't take the form of a financial breakthrough. Y'all got quiet on that one. His promise of peace didn't take the form of relational bliss. His promise of peace did not take the form of the approval of man. His promise of peace did not take the form of health and wealth. His promise of peace didn't take the form of perfect children who never go astray. He didn't give the promise of a temporary fix to our discomfort. He sent forth the promise of a person, one who would be present with his people and would give a peace that is his alone to give. So I want to tell you today, if you need peace, you have a promise. A child is born to you. If you're battling depression today, you have a promise. A child is born to you. If you're beset on every side by your enemies, you have a promise today. A child is born to you. If you're paralyzed by fear, you have a promise. A child is born to you. 
And I have to tell you that this is not just any child, because I know it sounds ridiculous to say that the answer for peace is a child. This child has a long and lavish name full of glorious descriptors that tell us an awful lot about him. So why don't we take a minute and get to know this child? The first element of his name is Wonderful Counselor. I think it's really interesting that this world was wrecked by a counselor. After all, did not the serpent in the garden give wicked counsel to Eve in order to deceive her and her husband into disobeying God? Man fell from God's grace by listening to wicked counsel. Sin was introduced into the world by wicked counsel. We were separated from God because of wicked counsel. But God promised in Genesis 3.15 that one would come through the seed of the woman that would crush the head of that old serpent. I think it's just amazing that the child described here by Isaiah is called Wonderful Counselor. For he will undo the wicked counsel of the evil one and crush his head once and for all. Can somebody say amen in the house? He's called Wonderful Counselor. He's also called Mighty God. Now, I want to park here for a moment because we cannot miss the gravity of this statement. The Jews were and are, as are we, staunch monotheists, meaning they believe in only one God, categorically, unequivocally, one God. It seems so strange here that the prophet would ascribe to a human person the identity of God himself, yet he clearly does so. The word he uses here in Hebrew for mighty God is El Gibor. El is the word for God and Gibor the word for mighty. So it literally reads God mighty. Interestingly here, this word El is used instead of another word for God, which is Elohim. Elohim can be used in a general sense or a generic sense. Sort of like if we were to write God with a lowercase g. That's how they would use Elohim. But the prophet uses El here. And it is used only, all throughout the Old Testament, only to convey a sense of absolute deity. If we in modern English wrote God with an uppercase G, that would be the comparison to our modern English. Only absolute deity is implied by this word El for God. And it is that word that is used to describe this child. And the word El Gibor is used several times in the Old Testament. One very interesting one is in the very next chapter of Isaiah, chapter 10, verses 20 through 23, where God is warning the people that he has just decreed destruction for them, but a remnant will return to El Gibor. A remnant will return to the mighty God. The same word used in Isaiah 9 to describe the child to be born. Here we have a clear statement of the divinity of the child to be born. But does that mean that he is saying there is more than one God? Of course not. It's in this supposed tension that we see the seeds of the triune nature of God. And only one in history meets the criteria of truly God and truly man. He's called Wonderful Counselor. He's called Mighty God. He's also called the Eternal Father. And I think a better rendering of this would be the father of eternity. We see this clearly fulfilled in John 8, 59, where a simple carpenter said to the Jews he was debating, before Abraham was born, I am. He he equated himself with God in eternity and so angered the people that they tried to stone him. We see his eternity in John 1, where the apostle declares, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. He's called the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the father of eternity. And finally, we come to one more term for him. This child is called the prince of peace. There's only one whose royal birth was hailed by angelic cries of Peace on earth and goodwill to men with whom God is pleased. 
It is the same one whose birth was foretold in Micah chapter 5, verses 2 through 5, where we read this. But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you one will go forth for me to be a ruler in Israel. His going forths are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Therefore he will give them up until the time when she who is in labor has borne a child. Then the remainder of his brethren will return to the sons of Israel. And he will arise and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord and in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will remain because at that that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. Watch this line. This one will be our peace. Who is this child of promise? I declare in your hearing today that there is only one in all of history who matches all of these descriptors. And it is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth himself. Jesus alone filled all, fulfilled all the requirements set forth by this prophecy. And he proved that God's promises are sure and true and that his word will not fail. Jesus is this promised one. Jesus is your wonderful counselor. Jesus is the mighty God. Jesus is the father of eternity. Jesus is the prince of peace. The promise of the prince of peace came to a people who were walking in great darkness. The same promise of the same Prince of Peace comes to us in our darkness. And so for the rest of this message, I want to talk about the nature of this peace that Jesus brings to the life of those who trust him for salvation. And I want to tell you, if you're here today and you need the Prince of Peace to show up, this is what you've been waiting for. And God has you here in the darkness of your chaos to speak a word of promise to you. Hear the word of the Lord today. This is the peace that the Prince of Peace brings. First, he brings us into peace with God. Since the fall in the garden, man's chief problem has been one simple thing. Sin. Every other ill in the human race stems from it. We were created to live in perfect harmony with God. Adam and Eve walked in wholeness and and completeness with and in their creator. They had no need, not because they had everything they could ever want, but but because they had complete and unfettered access to God and to communion with him. Their communion with him was perfect. Their disobedience changed everything. Sin separated them from their father. It forced them out of his presence. It broke their perfect communion with him. It corrupted their nature. They became spiritually dead. They were completely broken. But even then, God's mercy was on full display. And don't miss this because in Genesis 3.21, after pronouncing a just judgment and curse on them for their rebellion, they deserved every bit of what they got. After that, the next thing the Bible says is the Lord made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. In this simple verse, we see God reaching towards sinful man and initiating restoration. You see, an animal had to die for God to make those skin coverings. The scriptures tell us in Hebrew 9 that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness for sin. Please see the beauty of what God did here. In this first instance of sin, he didn't look at Adam and Eve and say, well, you've offended me, so here's your list of stuff to do, and uh, if you do it, I might, I might uh, let you back coming around. He didn't tell them to go kill an animal and make a sin offering. God himself provided the sacrifice. And it doesn't stop there. And don't, don't miss this. I'd never noticed this before until this week. It doesn't stop there because it says that not only did he make skin coverings for them, but he clothed them as well. He put the clothes on them. God did it all. God provided the sacrifice and God applied that sacrifice to their nakedness. The very thing that was the representation of their rebellion and sin against him. God covered it of his own initiative and can I tell you that's what he does for us in Jesus For generations, blood had to be shed continually for God's people to be forgiven their sins. There had to be a substitute to die in the place of the sinner 
to shed blood to atone for the sinner. But God did not leave us as orphans because in the fullness of time and in fulfillment of his promises through the prophets, God sent his son born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons and daughters. The blood of bulls and goats could not fully deal with sin, but what Jesus did on the cross was perfect and the final sacrifice for every sin you and I ever or ever will commit. Listen to the writer of Hebrews in chapter 10, verses 11 through 14. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he, having offered sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And now verse 18. Now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. Jesus, through his perfect redeeming work on this earth, repaired the broken relationship between a holy God and rebellious humanity. The chastisement that brought us peace was upon him. And this peace isn't like that uncomfortable peace that you have with the big mouth family member at Thanksgiving who blasted mom and daddy on Facebook? Y'all know what I'm talking about. The kind where you go in knowing it's going to be awkward, but if you just put your head down and eat, it'll be over soon. It's the kind you have to go into the back room and get a pep talk from your wife before you go out or your husband. You know what I'm talking? Y'all laughing because you know exactly what I'm talking about. You got to go in the back room and just... Get yourself ready. Okay, if I can just make it through this lunch, we can get out of here. (laughs) That's not what peace with God looks like. This isn't just a truce between us. It's not a ceasefire where God says, okay, you fulfilled the requirements. I guess you can come around again. Just watch it this time. No. This was a restoration of communion, fellowship, Love, companionship, completeness, and wholeness with the Father in Christ Jesus. Is anybody glad about that today? Hallelujah. And just like he did in the garden, God did it all. God provided the sacrifice. We did not have to do it. God took the life of the sacrifice. For according to Isaiah, it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And later it says, the Lord makes his life an offering for sin. We didn't have to do it. And he applied that sacrifice as a covering for our sin. We did not have to do it. Now when a holy God looks at us, he sees the perfect sacrifice of his son who took our sin in himself. Paul speaks beautifully about this peace with God in Romans 5.1 where he says this, Therefore, having been justified by faith, faith, We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't just end the war. He restored the relationship. This is why he's the prince of peace today. He brings peace with God. Not only does the prince of peace bring peace with God, but finally, I want you to see that he brings the peace of God. I think it's important here that we examine the meaning of this word peace that's used Uh, in the passage, because it means so much more than we think in passing thought. The word used here in Isaiah 9 for peace in Hebrew is the word shalom. Most of us have probably heard it in one context or another. It's used by the Jews as a greeting. Where we would say hello, they would say shalom. The Old Testament was originally written, written mostly in Hebrew, But sometime before the time of Jesus, it was translated into Greek. And that translation uh, of the Hebrew scriptures into Greek is known today as the Septuagint or Septuagint translation. The Greek word that serves as the stand-in for shalom in the Septuagint is irene. It's from this word that the name Irene comes from. In classical Greek, Irene is used usually to mean peace in the sense of absence of 
conflict or war. More similar to our English understanding of it. That's usually what we think of when we hear the word peace. The Hebrew word shalom has a much deeper meaning than just the absence of conflict, and it's almost impossible for our simple word peace to capture it all. Shalom means wholeness, soundness, connectedness, salvation, physical, spiritual, and psychological well-being, and many other things. It has a very deep meaning. So when, when the Jews say shalom, they're saying Many things. They're saying, are you whole? Are you complete? It's a deep, deep greeting. It denotes a right relationship with God, with others, and with creation. It denotes being in harmony with the way things ought to be. It's a deep, abiding, unshakable completeness of being that only comes from the presence of God himself. This is what is meant when the prophet calls the promised one the prince of peace. It literally means he's the ruler of shalom, this deep, abiding, lasting wholeness. He alone wields it. He alone defines it. He alone can give it and he alone can take it away. Let's say it this way. Jesus is the prince of complete wholeness. In the New Testament, which was written mostly in Greek, The New Testament writers use this same word, irene, but they use it much more in keeping with the way shalom is used in Hebrew. One interesting place where it's used is in John 14, 27. Here, Jesus tells his disciples, peace I leave with you, irene, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give you. Now, have you ever noticed how Jesus double clutches on the word peace here? In my, in my mind, which can be a little warped sometimes, my imagination, I imagine he says, he says to them, peace, I leave with you. And at that point, there might have been some kind of reaction that he noticed. Maybe somebody welled up. Probably Peter. Maybe somebody did that started doing that lip quiver thing. Maybe they looked around at each other in a confused way going, what is he talking about? So he stops and he goes, no, 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 my peace, I leave with you. Not not peace as the world gives. I think he does it so that he can draw draw a distinction between the peace of the world and his peace, his shalom. And there's an interesting historical nugget that that, that if we miss, uh, we can lose some insight here. So I think this can give us some insight into the nature of the peace that Jesus is describing. I mentioned earlier to you that Israel at this time, at the time of Jesus, was under the rule of the Roman Empire. Sometime before Jesus was born, the Roman Empire was somewhat fractured and contentious. It had really stopped being a a true republic except in name only. There were warring factions that competed for power. But in 27 BC, a Roman named Gaius Octavius defeated all competing powers, and became the sole leader of the empire, the first Roman emperor. He would assume the title of Augustus Caesar, and you know that name. With the empire subdued and unified, Augustus ushered in a time of peace in the empire. We know it as the Pax Romana. Anybody ever heard that before? I think that it's highly possible that Jesus is referring to the Pax Romana when he says, not as the world gives. You see, the Pax Romana was a guarantee of absence of war from Rome to its citizens. As long as you paid taxes and obeyed Rome. (laughs) As a matter of fact... One of the imperial slogans of Rome was peace and security. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Paul actually alludes to it in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 3 when he says, while they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly. Interesting, isn't it? This is a perfect distinction between our concept of peace and biblical shalom. 
True peace is so much more than the absence of conflict. In our Western English minds, we think that we can achieve peace by banishing the conflict, by banishing the stress, by banishing the sickness, by banishing the besetting sin, by banishing the enemy that wars against our souls. But when we understand peace in terms of shalom, we begin to understand that the things we think make for peace do not in fact bring lasting peace. Lasting, deep, abiding shalom is not found in the absence of upheaval, but in the presence of the Prince of Peace, the Prince of Wholeness, the Prince of Shalom. This is a perfect description of the peace of God that Jesus brings. And he brings it through relationship with him. In John 15, Jesus talks about what it means to abide in him. And he describes it as a two-way abiding. It's a mutual abiding. We abide in him as a branch in a vine. And he abides in us as a vine to the branch. The salvation that Jesus brings results in peace with God and the relationship that comes from that salvation results in the peace of God. When God saves us, Christ abides in us, feeds us, sustains us, nourishes and grows us just like a vine does to its branches. And interestingly, John 15, that's where Jesus is talking about abiding in him and he in us. That actually starts in the middle of a long conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples that started all the way back in chapter 13 at the Last Supper. Remember that the Bible was not written with chapter and verse delineations. This is one long story. This conversation starts in chapter 13, goes all the way through 14, 15, 16, and ends with a prayer of Jesus at the beginning of chapter 17, just before his betrayal by Judas. So all through these chapters, you're reading one long conversation. In chapter 14, he tells them several times, do not let your heart be troubled. Then, later in chapter 15, he talks to them about abiding in him. Same conversation. And then at the end of chapter 16, again, same conversation, just before the prayer and his betrayal, he sums up the whole conversation by saying this, John 16, these things I have spoken to you so that in me, somebody say in me, in you may have peace, irene, shalom. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. What he's telling us is that when we abide in him as he instructed, we have peace, irene, shalom. In that mutual abiding, the shalom of God is produced like fruit on a grapevine. That's why Paul in Galatians 5 tells us that peace, irene, shalom, is part of the fruit of the indwelling spirit of God. And this peace of God is available to every person here that is abiding in the vine of Christ. And by that, I do not mean that if you are not experiencing shalom, that you are not abiding in Christ. You can be in Christ and life will still come at you. Can I get an amen from somebody in the house? That's one of God's greatest promises. He just said, in the world, you will have tribulation. The Son of God said it, you can take it to the bank. That's a promise. Did I just throw cold water on the whole thing? <laughs> you can be in Christ and life will still come at you. It happens to all of us. Because we still have to live in a fallen world with a sinful nature that is at war with the Spirit. I am telling you that if you belong to Christ, you have benefits that you can tap into. I'm telling you that in Christ, you have an inheritance that you can access. You have the inheritance of the Aaronic blessing of Numbers 6, 24 through 26. We sing it every Sunday before we leave. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance on you and give you peace, shalom, wholeness. 
You have the inheritance of Psalm 85 and 8. I will hear what God the Lord will say, for he will speak peace to his people, to his godly ones. You have the inheritance of Isaiah 26 and 3. You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. You have the inheritance of Psalm 4 and 8. Somebody needs to receive this today. In peace, I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me to dwell in safety. I'm going to read that again because I have a witness in my spirit that somebody in this house needs to receive this word about your sleep that is so elusive to you right now. In peace, I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me to dwell in safety. Oh, you have the inheritance of Psalm 29 and 11. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Shalom. You have the inheritance of Romans 16 and 20. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. You have the inheritance of John 14, 27 that we read earlier. Peace I leave with you. Not my, peace, uh, not my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. You have the inheritance today of Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Irene, shalom. That's your inheritance as the redeemed of the Lord today. That's what the peace of God looks like for those who have been brought into peace with God. And it is all through the Prince of Peace, Jesus, whose birth we celebrate in this Advent season. And there may be someone here or watching online that does not have peace with God. I want you to know that Jesus died and rose again to reconcile you back to your Father who loves you. He did it once, he did it forever, and he did it perfectly so that all those who will turn to him in faith and repentance will have eternal life. If you hear his voice calling to you today, don't harden your heart. Trust the work of Jesus for your salvation, and you will be saved to the uttermost and brought into perfect peace with God. And maybe you're here today or watching online and you have peace with God, but you've lost touch with the peace of God. Holiday seasons especially have a way of making wounds feel fresh again, don't they? Some of you today are facing your first Christmas without a loved one. Some of you are concerned about wayward children. Some of you are stressed over work. Some of you are worried about what might come back in the doctor's report or what did come back in the doctor's report. I want you to know today that you have a Savior who cares deeply for those wounds and hurts and that through him you have access to a peace that is not tied to your circumstances. Did you hear what I just said? In Christ you have access to a peace that is not tied to your circumstances. You have access to a peace that is not tied to the sting of death. This peace is not tied to, the, to your children's spiritual state. This peace is not tied to your work situation. This peace is not tied to a doctor's diagnosis. This peace is tied to the rock of ages, the prince of peace, the prince of God's shalom. And it's available to you right now if you will receive it. Lean into the vine today. Abide in him more closely. Walk as close as you can with him. His shalom is available. Would you bow with me, please? Father, we come to you in this moment, having heard your word.
And I pray, Lord, that the seed of the word that has been sown today will find good soil in the hearts of your people today. That you will do what I cannot do. I've done to the best of my ability what you've called me to do. And now I ask you to do what only you can do. And that is to take the seed that I've planted and water it. Give it the increase. I pray that it takes root in the soil of the hearts of your people and yields a harvest of peace. Not as the world gives, but irene, shalom, wholeness, completeness in you. Father, I know today that there are those watching perhaps and perhaps even in the house who have not brought, been brought into peace with you. And I ask that your Holy Spirit will go forth in the seed of this word and draw them to you. Draw them, O oh God. Let them turn to you in faith and repentance and experience this shalom with God that you provide perfectly and forever. And Lord, I pray also for those who are in this house today who are walking in peace with you, but the cares of this life have been over, a little bit overwhelming and they've lost the sense of peace, the peace of God, a deep abiding peace. Lord, I ask you that you would help them to abide even more closely with you. To cast off the things that distract and that your supernatural peace, the peace that you described in John 14, 27. Not as the world gives, but my peace, my shalom. Would wash over them would carry away their stress, their burdens, their worries and their concerns, and that they would rest, truly rest, in the Prince of Peace. I thank you, Lord. I just sense you working in such a beautiful way right now. And I thank you that you have been with us in this house today. I praise you for your goodness. And Lord, we ask you that this would not be just a, a nice warm feeling, but this would truly be the inbreaking of your peace, your irene, your shalom, that makes whole and complete in Christ. I thank you for doing it, Lord. All the people of God said amen.